Conroe Cobb Canyon Coyote Woman, Sarah's Ruse. I am a Mutsun, Ohlone, and Chumash individual here in San Francisco. We are in a territory very close to Yolamu. Yolamu is a village site known and documented to San Francisco. Did you know that the first language here in San Francisco, the first language before Spanish, before English, was Ramatush? Ramatush Ohlone peoples, or Ramatush speaking Ohlone peoples, well, we don't know where or if they exist, but actually, I'm honored to know the tribal chairman of the Association of Ramatush Ohlone Peoples. And he is an amazing individual who focuses on honoring truth and history. And it's out of respect that I, a Southern Ohlone, acknowledge any space that I go to. Every space that I visit at, I attempt to learn about the indigenous peoples of whose land that I am on. I happen to be a Moulton Ohlone from San Benito County. I am from Indian Canyon. Indian Canyon is the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara along Central Coastal California. That being said, I am not from a federally recognized tribe, but I am on federally recognized land. It is a trust allotment. With that, I was born and raised in a space where we can honor our ancestors and connect with the land and have a safe haven for ceremony. When I visit other spaces, I acknowledge the indigenous peoples of these lands because it's so very important that we take that extra step to honor the indigenous peoples. So welcome to Ramatush Ohlone Territory. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> uh, thank you guys all for coming. Um, we want this to be very interactive, so please uh, ask questions in real time. Don't, uh, don't take notes and wait till later. I'd like to be in the moment. Um, my name is John Pomeroy. Um, I'm a co-founder of the CalConCon Initiative. To give you a little bit of background about it, um, it began as a response to some criticism that we got as a, as a Cal Exit organization. Um, yes, California, the largest Cal Exit organization in um, California, um, is now on its third rendition of the initiative. Uh, the second one is what gave birth to CalConCon. Um, we, um, we were told many times by many different constitutional scholars that there needed to be a consent of states in order for a secession to occur, and um, that's what initiated the CalConCon initiative. Um, are any of you familiar with uh, the Convention of States action? This is a big right-wing movement. And the fact that none of you know about it is very telling to um, how um, clandestine it is. Um, they're in the process of gathering consent of states to call a constitutional convention under Article 5 in the United States Constitution, which would mean that they could, without Congress, uh, make amendments to the Constitution. And uh, this has some really powerful right-wing support. Sean Hannity from Fox News is behind it. Sarah Palin is behind it. Uh, it's, it's frightening. If they're successful, the left has no response. So what, how many states have to be? 34 states are required for, uh, for a consent of states, yeah. So um, as far as I know, CalConCon is the only initiative that wants to uh, bring the progressive voice to that conversation. So if these right-wingers are successful and they successfully call a convention of states, um, we'll be the only voice that's um, able to, um, to add uh, our voice to it. And uh, rights of nature, uh, inherent rights, and indigenous rights are at the foundation of what we're doing. And the reason that Canyon is here is because our organization is using our privilege and power to provide them a platform. And there's so much infighting, there's so much drama, there's so much um, confusion, and there's so many variables that we're really just trying to get um, as many voices as possible um, engaged in this conversation. So with that, we'll begin. Um, fires, they're on everybody's mind right now. Right? Last year and this year, um, we've seen the worst wildfires in, in California's history. Uh, the Car Fire is the largest ever. It's, it's incredible. They've lost so much uh, land 
and we're playing a blame game. The California government blames the U.S. Forest Service for mismanagement. There's some truth to that, you know, by not allowing selective logging and, and uh, fire clearing, uh, fuel clearing, um, you know, it, it creates a problem. Um, I don't even like to talk about um, the quote unquote president. Um, indigenous people in the land manage the forest differently than uh, the state or uh, federal government. Uh, I don't want to read all this stuff, but um, each, each slide, um, if you have any questions or want to um, contribute anything, yeah, uh, please. To it. Yeah. So when I interact with the community, I ask people when they talk about climate change and talk about uh, global warming, many people will say people, humans, are part of that. And yes, but we, not in the way that the immediate assumption is when it comes to our consumeristic tendencies with single serving uh, plastic, the carbon emissions when it comes to some of our methodologies of industrialized farming and agriculture and land, um, uh, animals. The bigger issue around global warming and climate disruption is our interaction, is our failure of interaction. So if we talk about colonization and waves and waves of genocide of California Native peoples, these other nations, other communities came into this territory and they see California as an Eden. They see it as a lush, gorgeous, vibrant, and densely nutritious and resourceful and amazing. They see it and they see the indigenous peoples not interacting with the environment like they do with their societal modernizations, however they engage in their, their own environments back home. They see the native peoples doing things differently, so therefore they are seen as subhuman, savage, primitive. So if you dismiss the natives, and then you see this pristine area, and you just think, wow, this wild, lush Eden exists, and we could totally tap into it. And then as those colonized colonizers come through, establish their own society, establish how things are going to be, the native peoples no longer have their integral relationship with the environment. They no longer have the right to steward the land. Indigenous peoples have always tended and steward the land as if it's a relationship, as if it's an integral part of our community. The animals, the plants, the elements, the resources are not just resources and assets, something we tap into or capitalize off of. We have that integral responsibility to tend the land, to steward and have that relationship, to see it as a living being, to let that plant know that when we are harvesting it, that we appreciate the life that is lived and the gift that it gives that we are responsible for that life. And even if we are going to ingest, utilize, tap into, and we know we are taking that life, we have that responsibility. So when it comes to people play a part in global warming and climate disruption, it's not just our habits and our current societal standards of way of life of emissions and devastating methodologies of disrupting it, it's also no longer having that integral relationship and having that way of engaging in our environment and having that integral responsibility and so i'm like that's a lesser known and that has to do with our education system and how we are educated and acknowledge truth and history and these things are hard conversations to have and so i'm honored to be here to offer a little insight and i know many california natives who are shifting that paradigm around education around curriculum and you can talk to kids about genocide you can talk to kids about this disruption and we can also teach ways we can interact with each other on an integral level to respect all of our nations and our kin our relations the plants the minerals the waters the animals so little insight of our responsibility and yeah <laughs> So um, I'm just going through the slides slowly. Hopefully you're uh, paying attention to both. Um, like I said, I don't want to read the stuff that's there. I assume all of you can read on your own. Um, but uh, there are global organizations, uh, hundreds if not thousands, that are working on um, similar things, rights of nature. Uh, you've probably heard about the, um, <clears throat> the uh, tribe in, in New Zealand that got um, they got uh, human rights for their river and their mountain. Um, this is uh, really landmark legislation. Um, we're, we're very happy for New Zealand, uh, but we're a little disappointed that we didn't beat them to the punch. <laughs> uh, California is really close to, um, to getting similar 
um, similar uh, rights of nature. So. Human rights or legal rights? Human rights, yeah. If corporations can be humans. Yeah, exactly. So um, I spaced the name of the, the tribe in uh, New Zealand. Uh, I misplaced it. Just <laughs> uh, but I'm always someone excited. help me out? I'm always remember? excited about the Maori people. Maori? Maori, there oh, yeah. you go. I was, yeah. was going to say the tribe, yeah. more territory. Yeah. But no, not that, Maori. I love yeah. Maori individuals. I. A side note, just a excited note. I love that they have a repatriation uh, branch. They have been dedicated to repatriating and re-engaging with ancestral remains as well as artifacts and cultural items. And so they have a full-on branch that is dedicated to recollecting their indigenous, uh, their, their family's items. Items that were taken away by museums or colonizers or private collectors. They have a healing methodology of engaging instead of just angrily being like you stole this and we need it back they they do feel that way for sure mm -hmm. though they know that this item has been kept safe at, at any institution and they want to start a relationship with that institution and then gain it back respect it show the institution how to respect any item or anything and then bring it home in a good way and i find it so very beautiful that i have been honored to uh represent uh, our community and so, um, different interactions at those times to witness such interactions. I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh, we need it. We, we need to have this because we have we have baskets and things over in other states, other countries. Yeah. So having that, yeah, right. just, just to share, just so you guys know, it seems like a lot of people aren't aware that actually Hawaii does have public trust doctrine for natural resources. It's actually the only state in the country right now that incorporated uh, the public trust doctrine in with its state constitution. So the state constitution actually references kingdom laws and kingdom laws reference public trust. So just to say we, we have some excitement because we do have it in the United States even though it's still an occupied right. portion of it. But uh, yeah, there, yeah, there is a public trust doctrine there. It is a precedent and maybe that's something we could try to legislate in California. Yeah. I, I love that kind of collaborative energy and taking inspiration from various communities because it's so very necessary. It's, it's a time that we need to come together. It's, it's so necessary. And speaking of why they have uh, that same group has one of the most powerful secession movements globally, not just in the United States. So yeah. um, once uh, California is successful in its um, effort to become an independent and sovereign nation, um, we can easily invite Hawaii to do the same. And any other places, I'm sure you've heard of Cascadia or uh, Texas, you know, Texas wants to be its own. So there's the. <laughs> they said the same about us. Like, right. like a friend of our yeah. enemies yeah. are. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's not to be attached to a Russian force. That's it. That's it. Yeah. We we don't have any um, any responsibility to it. It wasn't us. We didn't do it um, as individuals, as citizens, and we should be able to establish. Um, you know, a structure that works for everyone that's here. And, and you know, uh, personally, I feel like the indigenous uh, Americans have the moral high ground. They were here first, this was their land. We came and took it, we killed them, we moved them all over the place, we used them as slaves. Like, there has to be some sort of recognition that happens of that. We cannot continue to disavow it. We cannot continue to keep them marginalized and silenced. We need to give them a platform. And that's why um, Cal Con Con um, is, is finding success with that community because we understand that we have privilege and power that they do not. And by giving them our platform, we're able to um, move further uh, together than we would individually. Did you see that in the opposite? Our, we're trying to prevent a Kong Kong again. But the last Kong Kong is what got the public trust on That's right. Uh, so now they wanted to get the plot to remove it. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> we need that voice. Um, please, uh, at the end of the yeah, presentation, yeah, you'll sorry, see. <laughs> no, please. We want it to be. Uh, we want it to be interactive. I, I can't stand going to seminars where people are sitting up front and talking and going through a PowerPoint and nobody's engaged. So please uh, ask your questions in real time. Um, this is my favorite slide in the show. Um, 
changing the United States Constitution to deal with climate change. Um, there's no question, 97, 98% of scientists agree that climate change is a human caused problem. And um, this um, is the number one uh, national security threat. There is nothing foreign or domestic that is going to cause more trouble here in the United States than severe weather. We're seeing it firsthand with all these fires. Um, I actually work with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric as a contractor. I do uh, power line assessments and we remove, tree, remove trees to keep um, the power lines from causing fires. Um, but the, um, the Cal Fire people that we've spoken with, um, we're talking about the fire natos in, uh, in the car fire. These were 300 feet tall. There were 200 mile an hour winds plus in the middle of these fires that were generated from the fire. There is nothing like that outside of the fire area. There is no wind, but internally, we're talking 200 mile an hour winds measured. And that's an extreme fire, extreme heat. But it's heat, you have huge heat that's, yeah. that's rising up and that sucks air in. We, we used that when we bombed Dresden as an experiment. Oh, that's Rather right. than use nuclear weapons, we said we're going to firebomb them and create this effect, which we did. Okay, not the people. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It, it creates pyroclastic flows. There were literally cars in the top of trees. They literally moved the cars from the roadway to the top of trees. Through the wind. Through the wind. Yeah, it was like hurricane style winds in the middle of fire. It was a fire NATO. Yeah, fire NATO. Yeah, it sounds like a really corny uh, movie. Yeah. But Shark <laughs> NATO. Shark NATO. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we need to do something about this. This is the leading threat against uh, the people of, of the world, not just our country. And um, indigenous nations never had this problem, right? They stewarded the land, they, they worked in harmony. And not just that, but they created systems that were that allowed nature to thrive even more. Right? There were a lot less populations. True. Like, this it's is true. One thing we have to take it about the masses of people and all the concrete and stuff is such a different kind of it's, yeah. and it, landscape. And it, it, what what plays to that is how we go about doing things. Mm -hmm. We are very familiar with how we operate in today's society. We do not have any input from indigenous modalities and pedagogies. So when we think about homelessness, when we think about mental struggles, when we think about lack of resources, when we think about how we interact, do we know our neighbors? Do we care about our neighbors? Do we care about how we affect other people? From as simple as cutting someone off in these roads to all of these empty buildings, if we engage with more indigenous pedagogies and how we are part of our community, we wouldn't be focused on a capitalistic, consumeristic, materialistic society. We would be more more concerned about the environment, more concerned about how we are interacting with each other. And we would, when, when I talk to students and talk to kids, they're like, well, where did you go to work? And where did you go to school? I'm sitting here like, the environment and our communities were our working and schooling and education. And we acknowledged our peoples. When we think about coming of age, when we think about going into elderhood, we acknowledge those stages. And we have a different way of engaging in a lot of these things and those are so very necessary there's a lot more focus on spiritual and communal wellness and if we have a chance to share that knowledge on a systemic level it would shift everything to meet the criteria and the demand of the huge populist boom and the way things have evolved as such but we need to fully crush down what we're familiar with Taken to take notes of what doesn't work and then start shaping and shifting and re-engaging on an integral level because yes we have never had this many people we have never had these these different interactions and we are re-engaging and yeah we can't just totally romanticize indigenous peoples like they did it better it's great great indigenous peoples adapted and adopted and re-engaged my existence to this day is proving indigenous resilience and many records uh, with mission marriages and other native peoples needing to, some needing to go underground and being silent because just for sheer survival because actually in 1852 or 1853 the US government got a bond 
to eradicate the California native. $1.4 million went out to kill California natives, $5 a head, 50 cents a scalp, to eliminate them. And then the Dow's Act gave native people land to actually get them off the land and free up over 90 million, or 90 million acres, I believe, of California. And it's like, all of these things are not truth that we can look at in history so we can learn from history. We honor the past to shape the future, but if all of us are not being educated on that front, we don't know these things. And if we don't know these things, we can be ignorant to them. If we can be ignorant to them, we can continue devastating what's going on and saying, we don't know better, we don't have the means to know better. So that's the hard part. And yeah, just getting a chance to get another perspective and bring this in. But as we see, some of these communities are waking up. But the hard part about all of these conscious-minded communities and they're waking up, we're only we're still engaging it in a consumeristic fashion with cherry picking. We are only, oh, spirituality, oh, that's really, really beautiful interpreting dreams, or oh, uh, seeing the life systems of plants, oh, really, really convenient. And we're still cherry picking and consuming indigenous pedagogies without honoring all of it. The same way when people are like, can you interpret my dreams or give me a native name? I'm sitting here like, do you want to know about the devastation of our nation? Do you want to learn about the genocide? Do you want to learn about how our system, of our governing system and our education system still suppresses indigenous voices and perspectives? No, 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 that's so heavy and so hard. It's inconvenient to learn about that, but I still want to know about the good stuff. That mindset is what we've been taught. We can engage with that knowledge on a respectful platform and be okay with it. Though we've been taught to be consumers, we only want the good stuff. We only want the, the sweet stuff on top. And it's heavy and hard. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm out for that. I, w I was one of those people at, at one point. I, was so, I always romanticized it. I was always um, really passionate about uh, indigenous studies and learning about you know, how, how they lived. And when I started to learn about the uh, less than ideal stuff that happened, uh, to put it mildly, um, it, it, it's heavy. It's alienating. Like you, you don't want to think about those kinds of things. It's really heavy. Um, so yeah, thank you. For that. The technique that we've been using to try to help people. Yeah. We've been trying to tell them ahead of time before we tell them how terrible the oppression is. We start visiting on people by crimes or like, before we live, we say we forgive you. And when you forgive yourself, we're here for you. We are here to forgive whatever it is you're upset about that you're misunderstanding this period of your that's, that's beautiful. So I just said the Oh yeah, tools. Is it's that uh, uh, Ho'oponopono? Uh, no, Ho'oponopono is actually a, uh, it's an interesting example. We have a lot of, a lot of us who think it's a, 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 just a whole work it out session. It's actually open a very, very deep and very specific scenario. You actually go into a specific home, whether it's a person, and it's usually only for family who don't read a big dumb. So if we have a problem and we decide that we're going to open one of it, we're actually in that home living together 24 hours a day. That's so, awesome. <laughs> so, we need more of that here. So it's up to us. Like If we want to say, no, I don't want to give them yet, well, then, but we want them to do one of them, then we're okay. sitting in that house for a little while. Free and prior informed <laughs> consent of what you're engaging upon. Yeah, and yeah the, the heads up, totally, totally. Like There are times that I will speak with passion, and sometimes if I am directed towards a question, it may seem like I am directing my energy towards that. In all actuality, it's my frustration towards the world and society, and I know it's being channeled, and, I, and there are times that, yeah, having that opportunity to say, this is... We, this is a forgiving opportunity, and it's what we do when we go forward with this information. It's now is the time that we are becoming informed. The same way that we can no once we become informed, we can no longer walk in ignorance. We acknowledge it, and so if we walk forward poorly from this point on, then there's a little bit more maliciousness or um, accidental, but you, you did acknowledge it. And it's kind of kind of like that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, well, it's a historical trauma as well as even with our intertribal, intercommunal community members, it's lateral oppression. That it, so it's historical, it's gen, uh, um, intergenerational traumas, and then lateral. And then also, let's just say, he is tapping into his privilege to open space for an indigenous voice. He has not lived a life of a person of color or an indigenous person, so he may not have the narrative or understanding of it. He is new. It's a beautiful thing that he has chosen to open space. Uh, he may never get a chance to be like fully immersed to know that historical things that we carry, though, but he can voice that. And it's an amazing thing that people will be able to witness that type of interaction to say, look, it's possible. It's not him saying, 
it's all you. It's him saying, I know I have this spot. I do want to open space for this spot and we can go forward together in this position. And I, I do appreciate interactions like that. Well said. <laughs> It's nice to hear uh, confirmation. <laughs> that is my intention. <laughs> so it's good to know that it's uh, that it's not falling on deaf ears. <laughs> um, back to this slide. Um, we have uh, three um, Native nations in the United States already with the Navajo, Lakota, and the Oklahoma. And they have uh, pretty substantial amounts of land uh, in those places. Uh, what you see on the left is um, the perspective for the California uh, indigenous community. Um, this is just like a, a, a conversation starter. By no means is this like the end all be all of what it would look like. Um, but this uh, section is the least populated part of California. So even if we took what's outlined there and retroceded it to the native nations, um, it would, it would almost have no impact on California's economy as it is today. So it's a really good start. And um, the initiative basically says that all public land would be retroceded to the tribes and they would be able to manage it on their own. And unlike the current uh, reservation systems, um, they would have complete autonomy. They're not leasing the land. There's no way that the that the Fed could come in and, and say, well, we're gonna we're gonna mine this or we're gonna drill for oil. No, nah, there's no way that could happen um, with true autonomy. Two two things in terms of the slide of all the ones you've shown us, it's the hardest to read because of the background. Oh, let me read it for you. Um, our solution as CalConCon is to change the U.S. Constitution to one, deal with climate change. Two, create indigenous nations who will manage the land appropriately to deal with that climate change and show modern governments how to do it correctly. Um, for example, the Navajo, the Lakota, and the Oklahoma, um, they are doing this. And CAL FIRE has actually reached out to indigenous peoples here in California to uh, advise on what they used to do. How did they used to manage the forest? To minimize the the type of fires that we've been seeing. Is that going to change the landscape? An active piece of legislation right now? Oh yeah. That, that's that's, yeah. that's going to be yeah. long before that can be voted yeah. on. Yeah, we're no no we're we're in the process of gathering signatures for it. Oh, to so, do voter initiative. Voter initiative. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure. Let me know when that thing's on. Yeah, it's nice, coming up. Nice, nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a state, not been. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, 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 I jumped on something he said a little bit ago. But, but the proposal is to make California a model of, of how that would work. By That's me. correct. The California Constitutional Convention is our response to the federal Constitutional Convention, which is coming from the from the right. Thank um, go ahead. I'll let him finish. Uh, I was I was going to move to a new thought, so please. I can't be opposed to this because I'm aware of the tradition that when you move, one of my friends told me that, that people prefer to be called people of ancestral heritage. Mm -hmm. But whatever yep. name it goes Great. under, I used to use the word indigenous. That, it still fits to me too. That, that when okay. we talk about moving people, traditionally, and I don't know whether we borrowed it from someone else or they borrowed it from, from us, but we moved them on to the most inhospitable, inhospitable and, and then if we later find out, as happened in Oklahoma and, and the Dakotas, that, that that land has value, we, we seek to undo that. That's where the, the misnomer Indian giver comes from because it's what we modeled in terms of Same how with scalps. we treated Same with scalps. these people. Yeah. By how do you prove you got yourself an yeah, Indian? Yeah, us going, we'll pay you for it. It was not right. someone else going. So we get the, we get the bad end of the stereotype. But, but so here, what I'm looking at in, in the model that you propose, if I understand the map, that's the Sierra Nevada where our water supply comes from. That's right. That would have a huge impact on, on the state at large and, and the people that were in the, the non tribal land. That's right. Designated. Retrocession of the water source is essential to um, the ability for the indigenous peoples of this land to restore the systems because if the water's not flowing, then things are going to be problematic downstream, right? 
if the indigenous people are stewarding the, the water sources the way that they historically have, uh, everything downstream is going to be better. So this is uh, really good to point that out, but also why I clarify that this is just the beginning. This is the, the, um, the area of low population density. Um, public lands are all over California, but it would look like uh, a leopard if we um, made that we want to make it made contiguous that map. So yeah, it it, we wanted to be contiguous. Sovereignty. But the, the issue is, again, it's with language and with colonized institutions. We have no language to have this conversation. We must give that um, power back to them. They have to be able to use their language to um, communicate the, uh, the principles that we have no language for, right? Um, California, as an independent nation, can grant citizenship to anyone in the world, no matter where they live. Right? You can be a California citizen living in India or Russia or Timbuktu. Right? California citizens all over the world. You pay your taxes there, whatever. And it's only an issue when you actually come to the land where we actually have our, um, our boundaries. But even the concept of boundaries and borders is absurd. If we were going to re-indigenize the world like that, um, there would be no boundaries, there'd be no borders. If you look at a, a map of how the indigenous people moved around in the United States, it's all overlapping. There, there's, you know, they're moving around, they're migratory. Some people follow the herd, some people follow the, the fish, some people um, were, you know, more static. But like she said earlier, people are welcome. Um, they, they inquire, they say, I'm coming to visit your land. Borders and commodification are two concepts that go with the cultures that existed in the countries that set out to colonize. That's correct. And yeah. Yeah, Britain, Holland, France, you know, America. We, we see it all over the place. So this is what's possible. If we the people understand that we have the power, not the quote unquote leaders, <laughs> um, we can do anything that we want. And all it takes is finding common ground. So we want to put rights of nature, human rights, we want to create balance, and we want to nurture creativity, emphasize safety, and health, and community, and dignity, and all of these things that make human beings so special make us so capable of such immense uh, beauty. So uh, you can email us at team at calconcon.com. I recommend um, going to the website, calconcon.com. Um, you see uh, this right here on, your, on our website. Um, you can fill that out and subscribe, and then you'll get a, a monthly uh, mailer from us. And um, if you want to join our team, there's also uh, a lot of possibilities there as well. We are um, in the process of building. We're still very young. Um, all of this stuff is very malleable. Nothing is set in stone. So if we have a large influx of uh, indigenous people that are like, yeah, that sounds really great. We heard that Indian Canyon endorsed this initiative. Uh, how do we help? Um, I really want to just turn it over, right? We've made, we've birthed this thing, um, but I don't have any sense of ownership of it. I don't have any ego associated with it. I would much rather let those people take care of it. You know, that's the whole idea behind this is to allow them to do what they do best, to steward the land and and be uh, wonderful people. Oh, did you need that still? I'm I'm trying to get it so that it shows up. Clearly, when I look at the photo. Yes. Um, going back to when you were saying that the uh, federal constitution and convention mm -hmm. in 34 states, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit more about that? Because it sounds like, from a political perspective, perspective of right and left, where's the weight for this organization in comparison to what um, some of the uh, right has already. It's a David and Goliath type. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like approach that we're in right now. Um, it's not even, um, 
there's no comparison. You're talking about billions of dollars versus grassroots and and fundraising. You know, like we have no money. None of the people that are working on this initiative are being paid. Um, you know, we we had to fundraise specifically to get the money to be able to present here at Soil Not Oil. So um, it, it's night and day difference. But um, again, we have the moral high ground, and right, so. And, and um, so, is there is there a way to uh, work with other people on the left to gain more support? And um, potentially, potentially, um, outreach is one of the things that, um, social media outreach is one of the things that, that I spend most of my time with Calcon doing, um, trying to get people engaged in that conversation. So yeah, it's, uh, it's different. Um, these are a couple of the, uh, of the things I recommend taking up picture of this yeah. this is happening right now um, next week really um, really powerful and um, yeah the goal of the end the goal of the convention indigenous nations representation oh no aut autonomy 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 is self determination the ability to exist without uh, caveat you know just to be so I mean, there is no representation in Congress from the indigenous people. You can have someone that speaks out. Oh, at the UN, many nations get a chance, but there's there's limited visibility anywhere. Yeah. And so with this effort, one, um, with my learning, recent learning about uh, Cal Exit and Yes California, my voice of support and endorsement is saying it needs more California native presence, it needs more inclusion, it needs more visibility. I'm not signing on for what example is out there now because it's already gone undergone many revisions and it still feels like a band-aid fix. If indigenous peoples are brought on to talk about it, to engage upon it and consent on what they want to go forward, then that potential little blueprint, the little highlighted area gets a chance to be uh, re-engaged on an integral level, uh, environmental approach, uh, land stewardship, and then examples can be made by saying, look, the indigenous peoples of these territories, as well as potentially bringing the neighboring nations, not trying to force all the natives to go there, it's the natives of that territory and whoever else wants to be a part of that conversation as it develops, can then start examples by saying, all right, yes, the check mark is they've been given the land. What are they going to do? They start stewarding and tending it. They start making examples of how successful it could be. That gains notoriety and then more efforts to re-indigenize and engage indigenous peoples of all the territories to show, look, this is a better alternative than what we have. Because right now, it's slightly philosophical. Right now, it's very abstract. It's, there's, there, there's a lot of concerns, especially around federal funding. Federal funding and aid programs, will it take away? Does it help? Does it hinder? And right now, we, we, we sometimes dwell in the negative of the, well, we don't think it'll work and it seems like a band-aid. So how do we engage and educate around it? Well, we need to show by examples and then allow it to grow. And so right now, it's those beginning stages of getting more voices, connecting, engaging, educating the public. And that is a scary thought, that the right is already coming together to do these things. And other, other communities are like, oh, just kind of doing the whole not dealing with it. Or like the whole idea of, I saw a little cartoon that said, um, I don't want to vote because it doesn't make a difference. And then it had um, about, <laughs> it didn't have about 75%, but it had about 60% of the populace with that same thought bubble. And it says, I don't want to vote because it won't make a difference. And then it has the people who are like, I don't like this or I don't like that, I'm going to vote. It's like 40%. And I, I think that that thing is a similar approach when we may say something that is in the beginning stages that has potential. I'm, I'm endorsing the fact that it needs love, it needs interaction, it needs various perspectives of indigenous peoples and allies and advocates around it to see what can be and get get those who are necessary on board and the consent of all of the people who will be affected and then take those next steps but it needs we need to come together and we need to offer that education and that outreach and then connect our communities to say hey we, this is a better a potential better future and quite honestly government representatives 
Right? Oh, I mean, we, we tell people everybody in the request us, we give them all their decision numbers, say, call them right now, here's their direct line. Nice. That's exactly how you feel about it. Right? Because they are carrying forth. They don't hear it. Because they don't, they don't hear it. I don't want to call because it's not going to make a difference. We'll call, even if you get told no, or if even if you get, get told fine, I'll call. Like, you're getting that. Yeah. Now, getting they, the note without their doing Or their executive aides, or all the advisors, whatever person you get in the office, that person, even if you never speak to the member, or you never speak to the legislator, that person will tell them if people are calling. Yeah. And for sure, it's more than one person. They will say, constituents are calling, and every constituent that calls represents a thousand people that take it in the community. Mm -hmm. And legislators know that. So 10 calls is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. You see the same 10 people every week calling yeah. that. Yeah. You know, I'm getting her call them like, Mm -hmm. For breakfast, I guess, because they won't be honest. Right? <laughs> Question. I, I would like to hear more, whether it's from Hawaii or, or someplace, about about this secession concept. I don't disagree with it. And my very first year of teaching, I was teaching fourth grade, which you know, people may know is mm -hmm. California history and The mission curriculum. Yeah. And <laughs> And, and at the end of the year, what I realized that I had, had taught was there was a group of people, those days I would have said Native American, Native Indian, but there was no American at the time, but, but the Natives who inhabited the, the space. And, and I knew enough to know that they lived in, in, in a thought of harmony with with the environment they perceived that. And then every culture that came in following that had more advanced technology, especially as it applied to weaponry. And that's where we ended up with who we are now. And I realized there was nothing in the syllabus that, that even allowed for, much less provided that analysis of it. So the following year, because I was still in charge of social studies, but social studies could help cover health as well. Nice. So it was a, a unit on health that was very involved, but, but that I'm going, I really can't come back to touching this. And, and so my question is when, if, if I presume sovereignty, and I would offer that, that in addition to indigenous um, people of tribal ancestry, one of the groups that we, need, that we need to find a way to reach out to are the, the many layers of disenfranchised working poor, some of them people of color, not necessarily though, but, but because that's one of the things that my group brings to the idea of the whole ecological mm -hmm. save our planet movement. But then the, the question becomes, after it's a sovereign nation, Okay, we as a nation and other countries, as you pointed out, have have a history of what we do to sovereign nations that that are offering a different view, especially if that different view could be catching on. That's an idea we don't want to spread, and we will do lots of things to destroy that. So, so is there some thought about what happens after this great moment of sovereignty occurs mm -hmm. because there will be a moment after. And and if we've gone into it with with best intentions and and you know peace and love and harmony, all of which are good things, mm -hmm. the other side has has their tactics for how they mm -hmm. recaptured what they think was stolen from them, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't theirs in the first place. That's right. Uh, um, that's a great question. Obviously, um, the colonizers roll with an iron fist. They use violence to get what they want, um, and you know that's a legitimate concern. Uh, our efforts are in creating a global coalition of sovereign states, so every part of the world has people in it that are unhappy with the current system um, because it's tragically flawed. We all know it's tragically flawed. We all see the damage that it's caused and continues to cause. And um, we, we're literally reaching out to secessionist movements all over the globe. We're having a convergence here in California in December and we already have almost 75 different um, secession movements 
sending representatives to California to, um, to create this coalition. And the intention is, um, who are they, for a lack of a better word, going to bomb? Who are they going to attack? Who are they going to um, use force against? The leaders for at first. It'll be the individual people identifying themselves as the leaders of the movements at first. But there are no leaders. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> well, 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 there are. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. We have to start to, that I think is part of the there are, there's always that hierarchy. There's, there, it is not a million solid people running around, very educated, speaking legislation, and educated people. There's that one, you know, there's almost always it. Yeah. So I, and we see it I mean, a ton of like They have files in there on all of us. They have, yeah. they, they, they're on in all our stuff. They, yeah. they want to to follow people around in cars. Tiger Swan. Yeah, yeah half time, I'm sure Listening you to see they, yeah. As they start to get higher and higher, they start to monitor them more and, and mess with their But it's the family and friends and neighbors of those mm -hmm. people who fill that role when something happens. The example right. that I like to use is with um, the Iroquois Federation. Right, prior to the settlers arriving, or the colonizers, whatever you want, settlers. Um, I like to try to settle. No, yeah. <laughs> settle for worse. They're, they're better trying to seek something else. <laughs> uh, you know, prior to the arrival of the colonizers, um, there were um, five nations in the in the northeast, and um, there there were uh, conflicts pretty much consistently over resources and land and. Um, you know, that happens in, in the animal kingdom. That's, you know, people fight for, for resources. Um, when the colonizers arrived, those five um, warring factions united. They're like, yeah, we need to put aside our differences. This is a bigger problem. And so that's what they did. And those organizations, those tribes, or however you want to quantify it, um, they obviously had leaders. There's obviously a hierarchy. There's elders and you know medicine people, but there's no head of the organization. It's a tribe. It's a council, right? And how are you going to kill a council, right? Unless you know where they're meeting at a specific time and you can you know bomb that space. But in today's day and age with technology, good luck, man. There's no way they can get us all, right? And I will they, happily- They don't have to get us all. Yeah. They, they don't want us, they want the territory back and the commodity that that territory offers them. But they, they only have as much power as we allow them to have. Ish. We can say I don't allow you to arrest me, but somebody can still arrest me and put me in jail no matter how much I tell them I don't do it that. That's Even right. if I didn't do anything wrong. Oh, so of there's still that, you know, we have that, the dynamic of that, and, and, and just to point out that the, the we're having soccer blockages, the IRS would be the federal crime to claim not paying taxes as, as, as given a sovereign. If you state, if you say the word sovereign in as a reason to not pay a federal tax, it is a felonious of like immediately bank. And so they built in a really difficult way to succeed because the second obviously succession is going to equate to where I was not paying your federal taxes anymore. We have our own federal organization that we have to give that money to to, to to take care of. So we that's one I know piece of navigation that they can easily use to incarcerate percept perceptive leaders in proceedings and whatnot um, to slow down some of those movements. So I don't know a way to get around that, but I'd love to have that be part of the discussion as well. But, it absolutely needs yeah, to be. Not I mean, it's, here, but, so. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a, a legitimate concern. At least for sure. us, secession yeah. groups. Yeah. 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 Uh, personally, I'm I'm not concerned. I, I'll, yeah. I'll happily um, uh, martyr myself sure, for, sure. for this concept. Sure, sure. Well, if, if it, if yeah. obviously we don't want to lose important warriors, <laughs> if, if it's not going to actually martyr out. Right? We're, we're all going to be gone if something's not done. It's true. No, right? no, it's we're true. racing toward our own extinction. Of course. So unless we all stop and say, all right, this time out, we got to do something, right? Because the way this is going now is not acceptable. They keep up. They keep offering up these "quote unquote" solutions that aren't actually solutions. Like this carbon credit thing. Like they have spun it to mean like this. Like it's the best thing since sliced bread. But if you ask anyone with any kind of indigenous wisdom, they're like, "No, all you're doing is moving the toxicity away from California and into the." Other. I mean, you feel better about doing even more damaging activities. Exactly. Yeah. 
So well, it, it allows the, the major polluters, which isn't to say we don't all contribute something, but, but it allows them to just go, it's a cost of doing business, yeah. which is, is not the purpose. You don't, right. you don't make things crimes and go, well, you, some people will break the law and some people won't because they'll just go, it's a cost of doing business. You do it because it's going to have a, a prohibitive lesson to teach. If you do this, you can end up like that. And the people go, no, I don't really want to end up like that. So, so that's always part of the balance. But cap and trade is, and, and besides indigenous, even the environmental groups came out against that. And, and Brown still pushed that through. It's a very checkered mm -hmm. background when he walks into the summit that he's creating. Yeah. Whenever I visit fourth grade classrooms, I talk to the students about <clears throat> we need to be aware of how our actions, our words, but our gestures impact not just that of our own selves or that of our family or that of our community or that of our environment, but the next seven generations in the future. Mm -hmm. And I like to do a quick romanticization to not scare them about the devastation of, of the gold rush, but I'll just say Think about those who came over to California for the gold rush. They didn't care about the next generation. They were blowing up mountainsides. They were t uh, polluting the rivers. They didn't even care if their own kids can go swim in that pool because they were so focused on their greed to get that gold. And what did that do? It devastated the environment that they, their own generations could not benefit from. And when we make decisions like this, we need to consider all of that impact. And sometimes that means saying no to the really cool prize at the end of the day. Because if someone says, if you do this task, you get this little reward, you have to say, I get that reward, though, what is the cost of that? Not just a cost in money, but like the cost of spirit, the cost of communal wellness, the cost of environmental wellness. And that needs to be a mindset and a way we engage and that it plays into how we are as society, how we are as educators, as we are as um, just as a nation, because it's playing out in, a, in everything else. Everything is relative. The same thing with like as simple as sex ed and respecting other people, like, seeing other ethnicities and having these race wars and having these drug wars. It all plays down to how we interact with each other and what we've been taught and what we condone, what behaviors of tolerance and acceptance have been brought about. And it's due to industrialization, which was fueled by war, and which is fueled by greed. And we as humans, yeah, we're gonna experience those things, but it's what we do about it. The native peoples, indigenous peoples everywhere, did have wars, did have interactions. He had some wars. Oh yeah, I said did. Oh, they did. I, said, okay. I said did have wars. Yeah, have we never fought, no. Yeah. <laughs> did, did. We're, we're superhuman. Oh gosh, no, we're, we're human, it's, it's the human condition. Mm -hmm. Though it's how we went about it. Uh, one example, I can't remember the nation, but they have um, a uh, interaction of showing uh, prestige in, in the battlefield and like count coup on another nation and that's you going up, dodging and and pretty much uh, shaming or uh, offending the other party and living to you, tell the truth. You manage to touch them and, yep. and, and, and tell the story. Yeah, and, yeah, and managed to do it and, and that, that showed amazingness. Or there's another one where if you, you if you bested your your opponent, you you scalp them, but they live through it. You only scalp a small little circle on their forehead, so they had to walk around for the rest of their life in that shame that they lost. And the other party, the winning party, got to wear the scalp for a year, and then had a ceremony and put it away. And so th things were engaged in a whole different level. <laughs> and and so yes, we we're humans. We 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 suffer from uh, envy and greed and, and anger and all of these things, but it's what we've learned as we become these adults in these communities and how we engage with it going forward. If we are totally colonized and entitled, we see things as resources and we see things as expense and debits and don't care and it's a cost of this, we don't care about what that decision did to those peoples that it devastated. We don't care what gentrification does because we're caring about, caring about our wallet. We don't care what this does or that does because it doesn't meet, we're, we're, we're focused. But if we do care, we don't need to be so soft and be like, oh, everything's impacted, everything's like this. No, we just need to be conscious. We need to be aware. What, one of the presentations earlier today talked about Achilles' heels in the other side. And, and it certainly is an Achilles' heel that for the other side that in addition to the planet, that they also see, especially the poor, but, but 
max amounts of people as being a commodity to be used and discarded when the use is no longer there. And, and that's, that's a large piece of the, the us, them, them, us, of the, the 1% versus the 99 in terms of when you're looking at, at how, you, how you then reach out. Because in, in terms of gold wealth, in terms of military might, they have an overwhelming advantage. Mm -hmm. But that only plays out as long as the people who are who are actually charged with with implementing that go, this is who I'm loyal to and why. Mm -hmm. At the point, and I've never been able to learn the name of the of the Chinese tank commander in Tiananmen Square who said, not pull back, but just hold your positions where you are because that that one lone college student that we always see, we didn't come here, we didn't join this force for the purpose of killing our own, we did it for the sake of defending us, and, and so, I'm told that there's actually a very high defection rate, for instance, in, in the people who operate the drone machines that, that kill by, by air attack, etc. because more so than, than our bomber planes from World War II or Vietnam, they actually spend time observing the person who's going to be the victim. They frequently come to have some identification with that person's human connections whether they have a similar philosophy or not. And, and that makes it so that over the time of, of multiple kills, they go, I, I really don't choose to do this anymore. And again, it comes back to this point that says, hey, as you're talking about doing this and, and using a legal means is certainly a part of the tools, but, but building the coalition so that many people that are not don't share anything with the indigenous other than that they've been perhaps a little less marginalized. Go, I have a buy in this. Oh, yeah. This affects my family, my community, the, the, the levels of circles that you talked about. Because on the other side, and then I'll be quiet because I talk way too much, that, that they've actually institutionalized. I used to give this to my students to think about. This was older students in fourth grade. But, but they've institutionalized that if you are a CEO or a board member of the board of directors and you don't maximize profit for your corporation, for the next quarter, you can be held fiduciarily, criminally liable for that. It's not just going, well, maybe we'll vote you out of office. There can be much more drastic things done to you. And I would just go, you know, the next quarter, seven generations. Where's the wisdom? Where's where's the path that seems followable to you? And promise that you quiet. Definitely hear you there. It's it's hard and it's 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 intriguing. But I do I do definitely uh, I do parallel with um, also others like pairing with others to have that investment. And so I, I really do see potential. Like I don't want to steer it any direction. I don't want to say it should look like this, though I do look forward to having an opportunity to engage with other indigenous nations to talk about this, to say what, do, what could this dream opportunity look like and what does it thoroughly look like? And it would be great to have spaces that are just for indigenous people, though if we are going to maintain a whole space, having other people be a part of that and having that inclusive integral relationship to perpetuate that the way of life because if we all started operate on that same frequency we can be doing better so it wouldn't be just give it all to the natives and only let the natives handle it it's like let the indigenous peoples of those lands steward it let the indigenous peoples of california assist it let the dispersed and disenfranchised indigenous peoples that were brought to california assist as well as those of disenfranchised communities and other people and then allow those messages to share to other people with resources and means to then say let them witness that it can be a successful model and then ideally 
over time after after a lot of growing pain <laughs> learning how to best approach this then as more people realize oh this this is an alternative and this is viable and this is something that we can back and it, it may need this or it may need that and you start creating the, the cleaner governance system of how it goes about but the indigenous peoples are at the forefront of that leadership and that integral responsibility because that's where their ancestors have always been from for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and then us meeting the criteria of today's society we are many nations we're mixed and come together so therefore being able to be a part of and I, but it has to be of the people and decided by the people. That's a wish and a dream, and I'd love to see it happen. And I'd love to talk to people about it and, I, and see that evolve as such. So I do definitely connections. We don't, don't need to do the othering. That's where I was interested in what you were saying earlier about the conversations that were happening about um, how to address and deal with the forest and how to deal with the fires, because obviously it's a huge issue in California. Other too. So, what kinds of conversations can be supported where there's actually wisdom being shared so that practices can evolve or or go back to better ones or whatever, but that the conversation evolves together? So we are all. My cousins, the Alma Mutsun travel band, uh, engaged with Pinnacles uh, National Park and worked with Cal Fire to steward the land with fire. And that, that was almost almost an impossible task, only because it's a national park. And but Cal Fire, being an advocate, helped and went forward. And it's those type of partnerships and allyships. And it, it really is those who say and speak up in alongside. So like when you hear, well, I had an amazing occurrence with Surge, support for your um, stand up for racial stand, justice. Stand up for racial justice. They use that position and then amplify. And when it comes to those conversations with land stewardship and fire stewardship, um, I've met a few indigenous peoples that chose to go through the Western academic system just to get recognized. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a couple professors in Chico State who are talking about land stewardship with fire and that integral relationship. And I just got out of a conversation with a cousin, a California native cousin. I'm misplacing her name. Mijo? Mio? Uh, I think. Mio. I, yeah, Mio. Okay, cool. <laughs> Apologies. And. Uh, she was talking about, uh, there was a heavy conversation around her it's talking about, oh, the devastation of the fires. And she tried to, she broke up the conversation, uh, she broke up the negativity by saying, but those acorns are going to be so good next year because when you think about stewarding the land, it takes, a, you, you eliminate all of the other suckers, all of the other plants that are ideally not ideal. And it eliminates them because Oaks are resistant to fire. If you only have a quick burn, you have a controlled burn in a small area, it eliminates a small brush, lets the oak thrive, brings, um, of course, the nitrogen and all of this back to the soil, and then all of the small shrub and coverage gets covered in that springtime, and all of the sprigs and sprouts, one and two years after that, all of these amazing plants are coming back, and what do those plants do? They fuel all of the animals. And the animals are coming back and re-engaging with the environment. If you watched uh, that the little video on Facebook that passed around how the wolves brought back the river, that also happens with tending the land and that is using with fire management, that's using other practices. And it's so very necessary. And it's, and it's not just fire helps this. It's this is fully encompassed in how we go about this. <laughs> so it's, it, it's, it's beautiful and exciting. And there are people who talk about it, write about it. Um, in another presentation I have, there's a book written by Kat Anderson, and it's Tending the Wild. Love her. Amazing. Awesome. And so, there, but there are more. There's a whole lot more that I'm still learning about, too. And so. And fire is, you know, that's one spirit. element. Sacred. One spirit. One sacred spirit, right? Yeah. Um, for us, it boils down to right relationships. Yes. Right? Having the right relationship with fire. Having the right relationship with water, oh, having the right it. relationship with air. It's not about control, it's about stewardship. Right? And right relationships with, with your family and your friends and your neighbors. Right relationships is the is the phrase, it's kind of the catch all and that's the that's the foundation of what Calcon Calconcon is trying to do. Restore right relationships.
Well, thank you guys for coming. Speaking of the burning too, if you guys don't even get the char, you should start collecting it, and I can tell you the places that I know who will take it all. The char is actually, biochar is really good for oh, yeah. If you put 20% into the soil, it, it, it actually the most. The College of Tropical Agriculture has a bunch of white papers on it. It's called C-car, I think, like, yeah. um, biochar is a good one for microorganisms. Yes. Yeah. Like, kind of Takes away the bad stuff, stores yeah, the good stuff, stuff releases amazing. it. So if you ever get cold to water, permaculture. Yeah. Ground it up, put it in yourself, ten to twenty percent, and and it'll be. Yeah. See? I want to offer a resource to you guys because um, there's a woman who wrote a book called. Um, I'm going to give you her website first. It's called pndc.org. Powerful non-defensive communication. And pndc.org. I learned about her work first through a friend who heard her on KPFA. And what I really appreciate about Sharon Ellison's work is that she basically poses these two models. There's a war model, and there's a model of reciprocity that we as humans are learning how to engender and foster in all of our relationships, um, the large scale, the personal scale, everything. And what she says is that the biggest addiction of human consciousness is the power struggle and our need to be right. And so, um, I just really value that and I, I want to share that with you guys because you're in these positions, you're doing so much work and if that's a resource I can share with you to support the work that you're doing, I'm happy to do that. And Sharon also is very contactable. She's, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. The uh, videos that we shot today will be available through the website, I think, and um, definitely through um, CalCon. That's why there's two cameras, one for each of us. <laughs> so you can feel free to, if you yeah. witness it, you can share it to any circles that if anything resonated with you, just share it along because if they weren't, we carry the people that we are with. As if when we carry those people, either those who are physically not here on this plane or those who are yet to come or those who are happen to be in another location because there are many important things that we are all doing, to share what resources we have and tools such as, hey, if I can't be there physically, I can share the video. Or what a lot of Native people run into is, I I wish I could be at all these Native gatherings and I can, I'm only one person. I wish there were more resources of people doing this because I would love to access that. So other Native circles who need that kind of interaction and to document it, so very necessary and, and some of those are simple but it's the sharing and connecting because if we just have this conversation it ends here yeah. then it ends here if we can share it if something resonates or someone who's good at editing clip it up and take the gem 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 share 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 because we are consumers we have the first three seconds to interact with and then people might stick around for seven minutes they might stick around for ten um and when it comes to some of these sometimes it takes a skillful editor to just convey the right message to just get people inspired and now there's like this crazy inspiration fatigue around sharing and like this, this this keyboard warrior where people are experiencing fatigue for sharing issues, sharing issues, sharing issues, and they think they're doing great things. And then the same thing with our mentality, the internet is a new thing, our addictions to it, and the next generation is lacking empathy because of our digital, digital interactions. And we are experiencing the feet, fatigue for those who us are trying to share, and then some of us are rewarding ourselves with that little gratification of the click, like, click, like, click, click, and we feel good because it's yeah. just like a little high. Yeah. So there's, exactly. So they have all of these issues around. They like around. me. They really like me. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and it's these, these issues around this digital interaction that we need to have that healthy approach. Next, I'm of the digital native, not indigenous, but native. Digital native. I was I was born of a time that I'm fully immersed with this technology, and other generations older than me uh, were immersed with it, were raised without it, and so we have these approaches of how we engage with it and how we don't. Some of us can say just put away the device, or some of us are like we need to be focused. We need to find that healthy moderation of the best ways to tap into the tools and also the leisure of it. But that needs a lot of love and work and, and effort towards that. The same way, the way we're relearning all of these things. So, so very nice. Right relationships. With right technology. relationships. <laughs> right. The hacking of the American mind. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't. But I, I, I'll check it out. It's all about that. And I meant to say dopamine. When you click right. on Facebook, it's a dopamine. Yes. Do it again and again. And again. Yep. I, I always slip those two up too. So, yeah. Yeah. You just said hacking the uh, what? It's called the Hacking of the American Mind by Robert Lustig, and he did all this work on sugar and the addiction of sugar and for children, and that was his first wave. And now he's doing this, which is the corporate takeover of America. It's all about how um, we 
institutions tap into the yep. resource of how to tweak mm -hmm. us to become Oh, yeah. What, what is it? Fat, fat sugar and salt. There's a, that book. Just like the, the solutions, like Doritos guy was like, I don't, need, I don't need this that much, but I know the right chemical compounds that make people happy. They're, he's creating a product that he wouldn't enjoy himself. Why would, why would I create something that I would want to sell to you that if I didn't support it or care about it or know it helped me and my body? I, w I don't even yeah. think I could execute that task. Greed. Yeah. Greed. I'm not sure there's enough in the world. Gold, greed, and genocide. A resource for me to you. Thank Gold, you guys greed, for and coming. genocide. Check it out for California Native History. Thank you. Oh. Hey.